Tēnā koutou katoa and a very warm welcome to this edition of Westpac Smarts, After the Storm, Supporting Mental Health in the Workplace. My name is Mark Ford, I'm Westpac's Area Manager for Business Banking based out of Canterbury. And they've asked me to host this w- webinar because I've, I've lived through, led my team and supported our customers through the Canterbury Quakes 12 short years ago. Wow. And I've been reflecting on that time of late and I do remember the, the adrenaline kicking in and getting us through the actual immediate events. But then I remember hitting a brick wall and hitting it hard and the, the sheer exhaustion that followed. I remember the shock, uh, the people and the place I love so much, what was happening. But I most of all, I remember the community coming together, uh, people helping people, and the enduring relationships we built, which continues through to today. So the good that came out of the bad, if you like, and I'm seeing that in the East Coast and Hawke's Bay at the moment. So this uh, session is scheduled to run for one hour, uh, with some flex time should we uh, need to run over time. The first 45 minutes will be a discussion with the panel, uh, leaving time for Q&A at the end. If this is your first time you've joined a Smarts webinar, uh, there'll be a Q&A running live on the right of your screen, so please register your questions as they come to mind. Um, please indicate which panellist you'd like it directed to. Uh, if you like a question you see, uh, please click on it to increase its ratings. We'll be starting at the top with the most uh, popular questions. So I'm grateful to be joined today by two really special panellists. Firstly, Westpac's Mental Health Ambassador, Sir John Kerwin. So JK has dedicated his post-rugby career to helping commu- Kiwi communities cope with mental health challenges. And together with Westpac, JK travels the country, sharing his story with thousands of people every year. I've been lucky enough to join him in some of those school sessions here in Canterbury. JK also co-founded Groove, a platform focused on well-being in the workplace. Also joining us is Dr. Fiona Crichton from Groove. Fiona is a health psychology specialist who's done extensive research into what factors influence our well-being. So take, I'd like to take a moment before we start to acknowledge the impact of Cyclone Gabriel and the recent flooding in the North Island. So as well as impacting people's homes and businesses, this will also be taking a heavy toll on the well-being of these communities. I know people are doing it tough, some some real tough. So while we'll be talking and making reference to these events during the session, what we'll be covering will, we hope, be useful to people and businesses everywhere and at any time. So JK, if you don't mind, I'll start, start with you. So I know you're out and about a lot in the community, uh, including in flood-affected areas uh, with Westpac in recent weeks. Uh, what are you hearing from people and organisations at the moment? Well, firstly, Mark, thank you. It's so, such a real honour to be uh, online with you all today, and um, my thoughts and heart go out to those in the Hawke's Bay and Gisborne areas and those that have been affected. We've also got some pretty sad stuff happening out here in Murawai, um on our west coast, so, yeah, I, I just want to mention something very quickly, Mark, which I found interesting. 12 years since the earthquake. Wow. You know, that is, that is amazing. And I just want to share a story. Um, by the way, I'll be coming to the Hawke's Bay in the next little while, but it's really, really important for people to realise that you're in survival mode um, and that's all good. You're beautiful. You've got lots of courage. You're doing what you need to do for yourself and your for community. Often the mental health stuff kicks in post which Mark just mentioned there'll be a there'll be a time when you'll need some tools that we can talk about today but just one of the things that I'll always remember from going down after the Christchurch earthquakes was I walked into this beautiful woman's lounge and she had a hole in her roof and it was raining and I'm going wow you've got a hole in your roof right and she said yeah but I'm incredibly lucky because two doors down they don't have a house and and I went yeah but you've got a hole in your roof, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so what, what was really amazing about that moment was the, 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 the feeling of, um, the feeling of sort of, I'm better off than someone else. I need to cope with this, but also you've got a hole in your roof, like, and it's raining. So th- there's a whole lot of different emotions, um, you know, and, and, I, and I was talking and then I'll, I'll throw to Fiona, who's, who's the expert, just to give you a bit, bit of a background Um, I tell stories. I don't have any um, education behind my stories or my stats. We call them JK stats, right? 
Um, so I'm a storyteller and Dr. Fiona is also a storyteller, but she is incredibly well educated and can tell you some of the, 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 the science that's going on in your head. The science that's going on on your head and your body actually saved my life when I was really unwell. So I think to, to get back to that survival guilt, to get back to sort of, gee, I'm better off, but I've still got a hole in my roof. It's, it's really difficult to deal with those emotions. And I was, I've been burnt out in the last couple of weeks. And I just want to tell you this quickly to set the tone for the, for the, for the whole sort of session. So I was burnt out. I fessed up at work. And, and what happens when I get burnt out is I don't feel appreciated. And I know that my people do appreciate me. Um, I get grumpy. So, you know, I, I'm really uh, outwardly friendly and then I want to I want to kill the cat when I get home or in my case foo foo moi moi <laughs> you know so a bit of anger um, what am I doing so I was looking at the date the other day and it felt like it was um, October and I was looking forward to Christmas and it was only the beginning of <laughs> the beginning of March <laughs> Um, now, what came along with that it was get over yourself, JK. You know, what about the poor people in Murawai? What about the poor people in Hawke's Bay? You know, so there was that, but it didn't actually change the way I was feeling. So I had to take a lot more time to look after me. And I hope you're not all saying, oh, what a, what a, what a goose, JK. You know, you, you haven't suffered at all. And, and that is true. But it doesn't change the situation with the woman with the hole in the roof. Um, that you're better off. So I just wanted to throw all those emotions in there because I've been thinking about how hard it would be emotionally for all of you on this call around a whole lot of different things. 75% of the world are burnt out at the moment without without cyclones coming and hitting your house. You know, So there's all sorts of different emotions coming on. And this hour for me is just a really, really neat way just to share because one of the greatest things I ever did was share my emotions. And once I shared them, I realized that I'm not alone. So those things are pretty important during crisis, right, Fiona? Absolutely. Um, hi, thank you for having us. We really, really have looked forward to this particular session. And one of the reasons why is because when you've gone through a difficult event, there are some silver linings. And one of those silver linings is a sense of community. And Mark talked about that. He talked about coming through the Christchurch earthquake and actually some of the things that happened post that were actually kind of good and that there were senses of community and people pulling together and we feel like one New Zealand when sometimes we don't. I grew up in the Hawke's Bay. This feels really personal to me and I also have spent a lot of time in the far north. Um, and for me, I feel really sad actually. So I am a mental health professional, but I'm also a human. And senses of connection and story are really important. So as we go through this hour, what we're going to try to do is normalize some of the feelings that we're all having, and they may be different. And one of the things that JK alluded to was that there was a woman with a hole in her roof, but she didn't really want to deal with that so much as she was concerned about the neighbors. So we have this thing sometimes where we don't feel entitled to how we feel. And that is a problem for us. If we don't feel entitled to the way that we feel, then we tend to bury how we feel. And I think New Zealanders can do that. We're pretty good at propping others up and sometimes a little bit more reluctant to deal with our own stuff. So today, I think we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do with our own emotions. How do we support the people around us? If we're a business where we have a business arm in the Hawke's Bay, what should we be doing? What do we do when we have conversations with our kids? Because we have just come through a major emergency event. We've had three years of COVID. So I don't know about you, but when that civil emergency beep came through the phone, my brain went, oh! I went into a bit of fight or flight. And I think many of us were there. So what we're talking about is another event on top of three years of a health emergency. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we support others. But most of all, how do we put our, on our own oxygen mask? So we're going to talk through some strategies. But most of all, we just want to feel connected to the people around us. Mostly the conversations I'm having with people are one, I don't feel entitled to how I feel. So we deal with that. And the other is how do I support others who are going through some stuff? So that's what we'll try to dig into today. Can I just jump in there, Fiona, with, um, this is just Bob the monkey, Mark. You know Bob the monkey, eh? my, <laughs> my ruminating mind that goes off down a rabbit hole. But I, I was thinking about it um, 
the other day and I, 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 I like talking about when my dad passed, right, and the grieving process that I went through. Um, so when he passed, obviously incredibly sad moment for us as a family, but I couldn't believe it. Like I was expecting him to sit up in his coffin and go, ha ha, because that's why, you know, he loved a practical joke. So I could not believe he was dead, right? And then the second emotion that went through was anger. I thought, why didn't we get the ambulance to revive him? I mean, he was 84 and had three triple bypasses. He didn't want to be revived, but I'm going into this place where, why, why didn't we do that stuff, right? And then the third emotion I went through is, I wasn't good enough as a son, right? But he, I, I could have done more. I wasn't home. I was in Japan. What could I have done? I should have rung him, blah, 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 blah. And then I think the fourth emotion was um, actually understanding what dad would want me to be feeling. And that process probably took about three or four weeks. And the interesting thing, when, when, I, when I talk to people about any sort of crisis, there seems to be a grieving period, Right of which sometimes you can get caught on one of those motions, emotions. I mean, am I right in saying that, Fiona? Is that, is that, do people have to grieve this and be careful they don't stay on anger or, or whatever, like yeah. I did with my dad? Yeah. You know, sometimes when we're in the thick of it, it's actually the easiest bit, weirdly, because the thing is that we know what to do when we're in the thick of it because it's an emergency, right? Um, Mark, you talked about the adrenaline that went through your body when you were first dealing with the earthquake. So the way that the brain works is it's designed to keep us alive, right? There's part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is in what I call, it's it's like the lookout. It's in the reflective, uh, sorry, it's in the reactive brain. It's the part of the brain that's constantly looking for danger and reacting. And what happens when you're in a threat a real emergency when it's really useful, that amygdala triggers, that lookout triggers, and it sends a signal to another part of the brain called the hypothalamus. I call it the, the command center. And that is also in the reactive brain, and it marshals those troops of adrenaline and cortisol. So what happens is your body is actually prepared to respond really fast. Your brain can become incredibly focused in the moment. So you kind of know what to do. You Maybe you're scooping up the kids, you're getting in the car, you're driving somewhere. And often the emotion at that point is, I'm just glad to be alive because that's where the brain is. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not thinking about whether the state of my house, what it's going to look like after the floodwaters recede. I'm actually probably grateful because I'm looking around and going, I can see people who are worse off and I know what to do. Tomorrow I'm going to go to the house and try and retrieve some stuff. So there's no processing of emotion. There's just reaction. We're in the reactive part of our brain and it keeps us alive. But the problem that we have is that we can stay in that reactive part of the brain because unfortunately, because there have been so many things recently where we're having to react to things, the part of the brain that's responsible for reflection, which is in the prefrontal cortex, isn't being exercised so much. And for us to process what's going on around us and to move to action plans that actually help us and calm us down, what we really need is time to process what we're feeling. And I think a lot of us have lost that when you're in constant reactive mode. And so what can happen is you can get stuck in an emotion because actually what we need is to be, we're going to talk about one of the techniques is to acknowledge your feelings. JK said, I, you know, in that process after he lost his father-in-law, he could get stuck in this sort of sort of almost self-criticism and anger. I, do, I wasn't good enough. I didn't do enough. And I'm angry that this happened. And it was at a time of COVID. There were a lot of reasons to feel all those things. So we need actual deliberate strategies to get out of that. And when we're in reactive mode, what happens is we're not processing the emotions. So one of the biggest techniques for moving past an emergency or moving past a stressor or a trauma is literally to acknowledge your feelings. The moment that you state how you feel, JK just said, I was angry. That's a really powerful thing because that was a recognition that you were angry, JK. And when you can say, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm worried about the future, I'm terrified, I don't know what to do, even acknowledging that, we know from neuroscience what happens is the amygdala starts to stand down and another part of the brain lights up. It's called the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. It is the part of the brain responsible for processing emotions. The moment that you say, I feel overwhelmed and angry, it starts to feel better. And it's why when you walk with a friend and talk with a friend, Sometimes at the end of it, you go, I don't even know what I was worried about at the beginning of my talk or walk. By talking about it 
by acknowledging it, the brain will start taking over and deal with it. But what can happen is we get stuck in the feelings because we're not actually even noticing how we feel or we don't feel entitled to how we feel because we're saying, I can't feel this because look over there, our neighbours are doing so much worse. So that would be my first number one tip for us as parents, as people leading teams at work, is maybe just have a kururo about how you're feeling. And, and even just say, if you're feeling rubbish, say you feel rubbish. I think we try to go, oh, I feel okay, I'm doing good because really I should be grateful. I'm going, take a step back. Toxic positivity is a thing where you pretend everything's chipper and it's not. Just say how you feel, share how you feel, gives permission to others to share how they feel. And then the brain takes over and you'll start to feel better over time. Oh, great stuff. Uh, great, great insights. Thank you both. And I, I love, JK, how you show your vulnerabilities. And, you know, it's, it's not a typical Kiwi male, or particularly a all black thing to do. So, you know, I like how you're talking about, you know, needing to talk in a career and, and, and sharing things with others. Um, just, I'm just thinking, so the, the business um, owners uh, in the audience here uh, having to cope with this stuff themselves, how do they lead their teams through this while having to cope with the stresses and doing it tough themselves? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start with that. Just just to the listeners, um, I just call the amygdala Amy, the hippo, whatever it is, hippo, and the, that real long word, the, the courty. So that's how I talk about those things. But, but they're actually really important for me. But And if I put them into a rugby sense, you know, I never understood why I used to dry reach before I played footy, right, uh, with nerves. And I never realized why I was so tense at times. And, and it wasn't until I suffered a, uh, you know, a medical depression that I had to, had to realize that, you know, the adrenaline that's in your body um, from sport and that sort of stuff, you need to make sure that you can flush it out and the adrenaline that will be in people's bodies. So it's, it's actually really important to understand the science to know, um, you know, what sort of going, going through, you know, going through your body and stuff like that. And Mark, now I've forgotten the question. <laughs> I was just, I guess, it's, um, supporting your, your, yeah. um, your new yeah. workplace when you're going through yeah. the stuff look, yourself. Yeah. Look, for monkey me, brain. Yeah, for, yeah, that was Bob the monkey just went off on a tangent, sorry. Uh, vulnerability. You're going to hear a lot uh, about psychosocial safety and psychological safety at work. Um, and, you know, the beautiful Dr. Fiona will be able to tell you exactly what that looks like. But I just break it down into two things, trust and care. The only way you can start building trust is by showing vulnerability. You know, I was burnt out two weeks ago. I sat with my whole office and told them. Um, and most of them said, what do you need? And I don't actually need anything. I need to take control of that myself. But I know what the signs are. And, you know, I talk about my AAA battery and we can get to that a little bit later. So for business leaders, show some vulnerability. You don't have to be Superman. But often when we get promoted or we buy a business, we think we have to have all the answers. But some of the best advice I've had is if you show vulnerability, that gives everyone else the right to show vulnerability. And that is the first step on what we call a psychological safety bridge, right? A psychological safety bridge at work is actually building it one step at a time. So if you show some vulnerability, um, that shows that you're prepared to trust your emotions with the people around and they'll take a step on the bridge, right? And then if you can back that up with some care, and in, in these cases, it might be whatever you need to do, an afternoon off because your house is, what, whatever that looks like, um, you know, and let's not put detail too much around it, but vulnerability is the most important thing you can do, I believe, as a leader to get the trust of your people so they can be vulnerable so you really know what's going on in their world. That's the not that's the JK theory, Fiona. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's always the perfect theory, really, because that's the practical stuff. I think that really when you're showing vulnerability, you're giving permission. And a lot of reasons why, I remember, JK, you and I, like four years ago, we went around businesses, remember? And one of the things that we asked people was, why don't you feel like your workplace, well, does your workplace support your well-being was a question like, why don't you? Does your workplace support your well-being? And, and we got various answers. But one of the things that we asked was, well, why do you feel that way? Why do you think that well-being isn't prioritised here? And the answer was, because I never see it in my managers. I never see it in my leaders. I can't be what I can't see because I don't trust that you really think that this is important. So if we're asking 
people, if we want to be genuinely curious about what's going on in the lives of our people because we want to help or we understand that if someone is suffering, that actually has a cascade effect along the team. So it's actually important that we know what's going on as much as they want to tell us. We don't want to be too intrusive. But you can't ask somebody a question that allows them to be vulnerable or asks them to be vulnerable if they don't get it back. So I think the key here is to actually start to be the behavior that you want to see, which is maybe speaking, as JK said, about some of the things that you're feeling right now, because I haven't felt anyone who's not felt a little confronted. And it's not making it up, just be real. And then the secret is communicating, showing that vulnerability, but also just listening, mm. listening and hearing. Because again, when people have the opportunity to talk, they then get the opportunity to process and then they can get to the point for asking the help for the help that they need. Because right now, that's another important thing is we are really bad at asking for the help that we need because one, we don't want to be a, a burden. And, and two, we, we, we've got a stoic kind of national psyche of going, I can suck it up. And we keep talking about resilient communities. Like I come from Hawksback. You know, I'm like, I, I, I swim in, uh, when you could in the Esk River. You know, I'm going, that's a community of people. And yeah, I'm really proud of them. But I also don't want to put that on them to say, here we have a stoic community who's really resilient. Aren't they amazing? It's like, yes, but also these are people that we want to help. And we want to help in the right way. And one of the things that's happened recently is we sometimes help in the wrong way. We decide what people need. So we should be asking for what they need. And you, we should, as the people that need to receive help, sometimes we should be asking for help and asking for the help we need. That, that's so important, Fiona. And this is really important for business leaders. So the psychological safety bridge, you step on that bridge, but it is a new learnt thing that we need to do in the workplace, right? So it's not something you've been trained for. You've been on the, you've been on all the other courses. You know, you've done the, you, you've done the planning course. You've done all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, as especially as males, we want to have the solution. But you don't need to have the solution. Like the other day, I just wanted to share my emotion with with people, and they said, "What do you need, J.K.?" And the answer was, "I don't need anything actually. I've got to find some time to get some energy back, right?" But what of what often we want to do is give the answer because we feel as leaders, as bosses, we should be able to give the answer. You don't have to. All you need to do is listen, like Fiona said, and one of the best questions is, what do you need from me right now, right? Mm -hmm. And then if that excellates, you, you know, if someone's really unwell, they need psychological help, then as long as you walk them in that path. But the second thing I wanted to tell you about when Fiona and I interviewed people, um, so we interviewed 6,000 people before we started Groove, and the financial stress and the financial um, uh, mental health situation was prevalent in everyone we interviewed, right? And there seems to be this weird thing about money where we're all embarrassed if we don't know what to do. And yet, you know, I got 32 at school C Mass. I didn't have any bookkeeping or anything, you know, how to, how to run a life when I was at school. Um, I just was worried about how much money I had for the pie and Sally Lung at the tuck shop, you know what I'm saying? But... It is an emotional thing. So you feel like a failure when you talk about money. <laughs> so often we, we, we leave that shit in our heads and we don't talk about it. And I think those things are really important. It seems to be one of these mental health things that's got its own little life of its own. Shit, I'm not going to say that I'm struggling because it looks like I'm a failure. Whereas a lot of the, a lot of the financial things, I don't like the mental health stuff. We're not taught. Well, I wasn't taught at school. So I've got this... I've got this hang up about actually talking to someone about it because I might look like a like a like a muppet. So, you know, I think I think those things also at the moment when you've lost a house or, you know, all those all those things around how am I going to cope financially is a mental health issue for me that needs to be approached in the same sort of way. Mm. Mm, no, great, great insights again, you too. And it, is, it probably leads to the, I can't imagine interviewing 6,000 people, by the way, but we'll move on. At least the, the, the most popular question here is around uh, recognising signs of mental distress in employees, particularly if you don't know them well. So I know you talked about sharing and things, but, you know, those people that don't talk and come forward, how do you recognise those signs? I don't know, Fiona, if you want to start that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I say is look for changes because, um, you will find that you've got employees who 
don't tend to be the life and soul of the party. They're kind of reserved. That's who they are as people. If you've got someone who used to be very expansive or used to be very um, in, always like me and JK, we we talk to know what we think um, sometimes. Um, if you've got changes in the workforce or changes in your team where you notice someone that used to be very chatty is now a little withdrawn, are we looking at people who are jumpy, high, hungover? These are all signs. Um, thinking about changes, often people will talk about the fact that they're not sleeping. And often we share, we can't say that we're feeling distressed and anxious, but we might say we've had a bad night's sleep. And if we're hearing this narrative a lot, sleep is often one of the predictors of poor mental well-being or mental health. Um, people are complaining about aches and pains. Now, aches and pains are a sign because with adrenaline and cortisol, you're in fight or flight all the time. So your body's aching. So people might be expressing, you can see that they're actually tired, fatigued, withdrawn. Um, are they focusing, concentrating? Um, what, what are we doing in terms of a, a workplace? Are people able to focus on their work? Do they seem distracted? Are they um, turning up on the way that they used to turn up? And, you know, how are they expressing things? Does it feel a little change in kind of a negative outlook? Now, some people are just negative. That's who they are. It's fine. But if you can see that negative view of self or others, or in terms of burnout, what we're looking for is because I know that with leaders, we're seeing more and more leadership burnout because they're taking on the stress of others. What we should be looking for in our leaders, but generally in our workers, is burnout is what I call code red. Reduce personal accomplishment. That means we're not as good as we used to be at work, or at least we don't think we are. E is emotional distress or um, emotional and physical distress, but emotional distress. They just feel so stretched all the time. You might recognize this in yourself. You're going, I, I'm not doing as well as I used to at work. I feel emotionally stretched. I just have no energy for work generally and the last sign with burnout is what we call depersonalization that is about cynicism about work or the people that you're dealing with we can all have that <laughs> sorry jk yeah i know i can be annoying um so what can happen is even the people that you love around you start to they'll say something and you're going oh, of course they say that you can have that in a dialogue so that's the burnout side of it, um, which actually I think we should all be aware of. And it can be helpful just to go, oh, I'm facing burnout when I start to be a bit cynical about the people around us. And if we're looking in our team at seeing that um, particularly often in, the, in these circumstances, we start relying on drink or drugs. Um, I know that a lot of us drank through lockdown. <laughs> um, and if that's starting, if people are high and hungover, then I think that's one of the signs in New Zealand. And um, what we do know is that people can get aggressive when they're stressed. That is almost, it's not their fault, actually. It's its about being able to emotionally regulate. So you're looking for changes and you're looking for changes around how people are expressing their feelings, how they turn up at work. And I also want to say that sometimes there are no signs. And so sometimes people turn up at work, they've got a big smile on their face, they're helpful, and you will know all those people in our lives and we have no idea. So sometimes there are signs and sometimes there are not. So that's why conversations can be helpful. Hmm. If you're having I'm, conversations in your workplace all the time, then you might be able to figure stuff out. Sorry, JK. Yeah. No, no, I was putting up my hand because you were talking about me. <laughs> that's why I was putting up my hand. Not, not that I wanted to talk. It wasn't like in class. It was like, actually, you're talking about me. Oh. You know? not, the, not, um, the, not the drink and drugs, I hope, JK. Well, no, actually, a part, of, part of my problem, mate, is like I say to people, drinking's not my problem, stopping is. So, no, drinking is part of my problem. When I'm burnt out, I want to go to alcohol. And, and the, the most important thing is I know that. Um, so what, what Fiona is talking about, and this is what I've just presumed over the last little while, because it's the truth. If I was a leader right now, just presume everyone is suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, you cannot be like 70, and, and this is JK stats, right? So I'm just, when you see me looking down, I'm taking notes because I, I, I have all these thoughts, and if I don't write them down, I want a button, which is not very good. Um, so listen, what I wrote down when when Dr. Fiona was talking is, we just got some stats the other day that 75% of the world is burnt out. 75% of the world. So you had yeah. Cyclone Gabriel on that, right, for half our country. You're going, we've just come out of COVID. We're burnt out. Now we've had this shit thrown at us. You should just presume, as a boss, 
that everyone is suffering in some way. So you don't have to look for those problems. So I wrote that down, um, right? And and the, the, the thing is, we are now in an emotional crisis that we've never had to deal with before. You know, the COVID's over, uh, finally the rains have left, but we are left with the emotional crisis. So what do we do about that? What's the tractor that's going to dig us out? And what I talk about, so the other day when I spoke about my burnout, I had three or four people from work reach out and say, thanks, JK, I'm feeling the same. The question back, what do you need? Nothing, I'm all good, I'm aware now. So I talk about my my AAA battery, and I made a slide for you, Mark. You okay? I'm sure you'll understand the slide. Oh, can I give I'm going to okay? bring, bring it up technically now. Ta-da! <laughs> there it is. There's my slide. <laughs> um, so Love I it. talk about my AAA battery, right? And if you can't see what's written there, my AAA battery comes back to my emotion. So I'm aware when I'm not in my groove, and we can talk about that in a minute. But what I do is my first day is I'm aware that something's a little bit off, right? So for example, a couple of weeks ago with my burnout, I'm, I'm walking around thinking, why don't people appreciate me? That is one of my emotions around me being burnt out because it's just not true, right? But the second thing is acknowledging it. You think about it. Sometimes we're walking around, we've got this little clunky thing in our emotions and we know and we, we'll probably think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it on the weekend, right? So... First is the awareness, then your acknowledgement, right? I'm feeling like this, and then act on it. Do what you need to do. Like, and I tell I tell the whole world my whole life because I don't give a shit, but it might be just keeping it privately in your home and sharing it with your loved ones, but act on it in some way. My action was to tell the workplace and then take a little bit more care for me, and that little bit more care for me is actually doing a bit more cooking or a bit more guitar or a little bit more reading. Right. Mm, mm. So I think if you look at the AAA battery, two things out of that discussion. Presume everyone's not well. Just presume it right now, because the chances are 10 percent are well and 90 percent are unwell when it might have been turned around the other way before COVID. And then keep showing that vulnerability and keep talking about how you feel. You know, so so when I talk about when I'm well and I, you know, and we, I talk about being in my groove. You know, so knowing how you feel when you're nailing it, when you're in your groove, man, when you when life's good, right? And so I talk about it. I don't have any doubt. So I've got I've got some sharks I have, right? Um, I've got a doubt shark. I've got a dumb shark, right? So when I'm well, those doubts and sharks and things aren't in my life. I'm really curious, right? Is that spout right, Fiona? Beautiful. Right. Um, I'm really creative. Okay, um, I'm really positive and sorry I've put the wine there, but I see the glass half full. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm optimistic. Yeah, right. And I really enjoy the little things. I love dancing. I love music. Right. And those things give me heaps of joy in my life. Okay. Um, and oh, oh, yeah, this is a really important one. Things are good at home. Mum, you know, my wife doesn't think I'm a goose and. Everything's going well with the family. Um, so that's really important to understand. When I say awareness, I know when I'm in my groove. So I also know when I'm not, right? Mm. And mm. so when I spoke about burnout, and I don't want to keep talking about it because lots of people are suffering way more things than me, but I just wanted to make that comparison. So when one of those emotions is not when I'm in my groove, like, oh, I don't feel appreciated or I'm getting angry, I know I'm not in my groove. So that's my awareness then I acknowledge it and then I act on it so what I did is I said JK you need to take more time last Saturday I did absolutely nothing I played the guitar and I'm a terrible guitar player for like two hours but it was like washing my brain so I did the whole self-care bit right but so sometimes crisis like this make us more aware of our emotions and I think that's amazing and if you can be aware and understand when you're in your groove you'll know when things are clunky and then you can start acting on it that was a long answer. Sorry, team. That's Bob the monkey's fault. If you know I, mean. I, I love this so much. And what I so if you have noticed, I guess what I didn't finish with because I forgot was okay. So you've noticed or you're thinking that um, something might be wrong with someone. Then I think the next question is, well, then what do I do with that? You know, if I'm assuming, as JK said, that everyone isn't doing so well and we just said have the conversations, but sometimes you want to approach somebody, I think, to have that conversation. And at Groove, we we talk about um, care, 
have a care conversation. And this is how you do it. Care is, C is check-in. And check-in is literally just go in and ask someone how they're doing. Because you know what? It's normal to be asking people how they're doing right now. And it might be something like, I've noticed that something's gone wrong, or I've noticed that there's been a change, or how is the family? Have a conversation starter with that check-in. It's literally just a, how are you going? Are you okay? Conversation. But choose a place where you won't be interrupted and choose a place where that person will feel comfortable. If you're a parent of a teenager, you will know teenagers do not want to eyeball you while they're having conversations. Cars are fantastic for these conversations. At Groove, uh, we used to have a place, a little, a little park where we could talk to each other on a park bench, literally sitting side by side. And people can often open up when you're not eyeballing them. It makes them feel less vulnerable. So you're checking in and choosing the right time or place. A is for actively listen. Your job is not to be the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the counsellor. In fact, we don't want you to be. But listening for the reasons that I talked about before, giving a person a chance to process their emotions actually helps the brain help them. So you're giving them, doing them a favour. And really, why do people not want to disclose? They're worried about stigma and judgment. They might think I'm not entitled to this feeling because I'm not doing, I, I didn't have, I didn't lose my house, but yet I'm feeling traumatised every time I hear the rain fall because I'm plunged back to that, that feeling. So actively listen means do it without judgment. You're listening and you're reassuring, which is that part of that CARE acronym. And it's reassuring that it's not a burden for you. I think a lot of people are reluctant to either ask for help or have conversations right now because they know everyone's got stuff and they don't want to burden them. So as leaders, as co-workers, we just say, I'm here for you and I want to listen. I really want to hear what's going on for you. So it's a reassurance that it's not too much for me. And then you're just smiling and nodding. I know that sounds like a trite thing to do, but if you are being quiet because your job is listening, you also have to show you listening. Otherwise, people feel like they're talking and boring you. And the last part of the acronym CARE E is encourage the right help. Now we have an app, the Groove app. It is absolutely free right now. We have a free version. Um, it could be encourage the right help. We've got amazing resources in that app. So you might say download the Groove app. It depends on what you've heard. Sometimes the conversation will have been enough. But it is not on you to fix this problem. So it could be a suggestion of downloading the app. It could be saying EAP. I think maybe you need EAP. It could be I think you possibly need to go and see your GP to get some advice. Or it could be even saying, in New Zealand, we have 1737. Text or call, it's available and free for 24-7. And it's available to all of us. So there are some things that you can suggest, but it is not on you to fix them. One thing you could do is if you're really worried about someone is part of feeling distressed is people feel frozen. They don't feel able to make calls. And sometimes it can be frustrating because you've had a care conversation and someone will walk away and say, you know what, I'm off to get EAP or I'm off to my GP. And you're like, yes, fantastic. I've encouraged some help. And then next time you see them, they're like, no, nah, 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 I haven't done that. It's not because they're being bloody minded. It's because they can't. So one thing you can do perhaps is say, look, while you're sitting next to me, why don't I make the call with you? Or I make the appointment and I'll drive you there. And so that's it. That's the role there. It is not on you to fix it and take it on. And then you go to JK's AAA. How do you top up now? Because these conversations are exhausting and they do take things from you. So on that day, I want you to then, the days you're having these care conversations as leaders and co-workers, as parents, as children, do something to top up that night. Have something delicious to eat. Dance. Think of JK's AAA battery. And remind yourself that you are not a machine. So these conversations are also exhausting. So you're topping yourself up as well. Oh, great, great insight, Fiona. And, and um, if we can pan to JK for a second, he showed us a slide, uh, which well, probably didn't come up on the on the group. Um, uh, he's, well, magnificent slides, JK. You've got a Thank real... You. I've been, up, I've been up all night uh, building this PowerPoint, by the way, Mark, so I hope you appreciate it, mate. <laughs> I know you do, mate. <laughs> um, care you've just taken. just, oh, just uh, another thing that I think is really awesome, and this is one thing that Dr. Fiona's really, um, really emphasised since we've been working together, um, like try shit and it's not an exam, <laughs> right? So I just want to show you, I, I've made another, I've made another um, PowerPoint for you, Mark. 
Um, but this is around what I do when I'm feeling burnt out. So what you need to do is try stuff. And like Fiona said, you can go into the app and try different stuff. There's no rules to this. You just need to make sure that you find something that's going to do you. So this is what I do when I'm sort of feeling a bit burnt out. And they, these are the Bs, right? So I breathe. I set boundaries, right? I take bigger breaks, right? I look after my body and I'll be kind to myself, right? So I call those my burnout bees, right? Um, and so a couple of weeks ago when I did, when, when I was feeling like that, I just, I just added more of this to my day. Now, I already have a pretty solid daily mental health plan, but I just needed to add more of this to my day, right? So... If you're feeling crisis, if you're feeling some of that guilt, survival guilt, and all that sort of stuff, it's really important that when you act, try stuff, but also don't judge it. Because when I started my recovery, I was judging stuff. Oh, shit, I should be good at that. But just try stuff. Um, and I've found, and this is Dr. Fiona who gave me the bees, right? Um, that's my bees there. So that's what I do when, I, when, I, when I'm burnt out. And I think, you know, the acronym of care I've actually um, done that as as a co-founder of a business. I also know within that my hardest one is active listening because I want to help straight away. That's why I write stuff down because if I don't, I want to jump in. So that's a leadership issue of mine. So as a leader, sometimes you're thinking and you want to uh, get the results. So I knew that part of my care problem uh, is my active listening because I want to help. So that's why you see me making notes and that's why I make those PowerPoints because for me, actively listening is hearing, not giving the solution, but then actually talking about what helps me, which then might stimulate someone else to go, well, I need to try that. Did that make any sense at all? Perfect. Absolutely. 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 Um, she just uh, um, brings me to, a, I guess, a trend we're seeing in Christchurch now all these years later is uh, a Tamariki, a, a youth uh, the youth mental health stats uh, are just going through the roof in, in Christchurch, a lot more than the rest of the country, and it's 12 years on. And I know, uh, JK, you've been out to my health with Westpac and seen the great work they're doing here in Canterbury, yes. but I was wondering what we can do now to to help our, our youth um, in, in, the, in the immediate after, aftermath to try and minimise those long-term effects. Well, Fiona, this might be one for you. Yeah, so talking is really important, but often kids don't want to talk to us um, so <laughs> there are a couple of things. Um, having those conversations at dinner, where are your times where you can reach out to the kids around you? Dinner times, and I know JK will also attest to this, we, we've both brought up teenagers, now they're in their 20s. Um, those dinner times are really important. Now, I use something called the, the, the peach, the pit, and the blossom at, at dinner time. And because human beings have a negativity bias, it's important that we actually consciously notice the good things that are around us, but we also talk about our challenges, but we we temper the challenges with the good. So the peach, the pit and the blossom is something that I brought did with my kids where we would say the, the, the peach are the three good things that happened today. Because what we need to sometimes do is remind ourselves of some of the good things that happen because our brains are wired to look for the negative, to keep us safe. So the good things could be today I had this, that for me, I had this great webinar with Mark. That was, I met Mark. He's fantastic. What a great conversation we had. That's my first good thing. My second good thing is I went for a walk with the dog this morning, even though it was grey and it was spitting a bit. But, you know, I had I got some time outside. And my third good thing is that I have matching socks. There's my three good things. And then the pit is what were the challenges that I faced today? And it goes around the table and we all say it and, you know, the kids are a bit begrudging about it, but okay. So they'll say whatever their three good things were. You need three to one challenge because we cling on to the negative. And I would say the challenge today, my challenge today was I was flat because it's been like collectively we're feeling flat and I'm not a flat person. And so my challenge today, and I and I got there, was to actually rise above that feeling of blah, of going, ah, oh, and not feeling entitled to feeling blah. I'm feeling great, by the way. But for about half an hour, I kind of sat there and went, oh, it's Friday, but, you know, I, I've got so much on. And I had to kind of change the dialogue. But it was a challenge for me today. And then the Blossom, because I am from the Hawke's Bay, we had Blossom Festival, a blossom is the thing that you look forward to. 
And so I'm looking forward to big time this afternoon because this afternoon I've sh cleared my schedule of all meetings and I'm just going to get some focus work done. I'm looking forward to that. And I know that that sounds small, but as a family, what it does is you learn a lot in the good things, the challenges, and the things that you're looking forward to. And it doesn't make it hard, right? Because kids, if you go, how are you, will probably go, fine. All good. All good. All good. And, then you're, <laughs> and the more that you ask, the more annoyed that they get. So this is actually a technique for going forward, um, and it's really helpful. And the other is just giving space for uh, little kids to actually name how they're feeling for the very reason is the part of the brain that's activated. Now, you've got lots of experience in this area, JK. What, what do you suggest? Yeah, I wrote a book called, well, I didn't write a book because I can't even spell, so someone wrote it with me and for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was about parenting mental health in the home. So while I'd suffered, I wanted to know how to parent it. And so I asked because, you know, I had... Um, I met with a bunch of sort of 14 or 15 year olds and I walked in and said, up to, and they went, ooh, awkward, OG, like you're awkward, you know? And I said, well, if I can't say up G or get a bro, cause I'm an o OG, <laughs> which is an old geezer I found out later on, um, <laughs> you know, because I don't get a response. How can I talk to you guys, right? Um, and they said, well, the interesting thing about you parents is, you know, you spend all day at work and then you bounce in the door and you want us to talk to you, but we've actually been listening to adults all day and don't want to talk to you. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that was the first, oh, yeah, okay, get that. So, you know, I think I'm bouncing the door, you know, yeah, dad's home. Ah, and they're going, oh, here's another one. Um, so that was the first learning. The second learning was, and Fiona's always mentioned it, um, your children will come and give you signs when they want to talk. And they all said to me, when we want to talk, you're busy. And I went, oh, mm. that hurts. That hurt. That hurt because it was when I thought about it, I thought, oh, that's true. Um, you know, so that was the second thing. So I, I had a deal with my kids that because to be truthful, if my kids rings me one minute before a meeting and I'm walking into a meeting, I'm not picking up the phone. I'm not talking to them. Right. So that's the reality. You might not want to admit it to yourself, but that was my reality. No, I'm not saying it's your reality, but it's my reality. Um, you know, and then the third thing is when we actually do want to talk, um, you need to know when that is. <laughs> right. And that's why I think the whole, you know, sitting in the car, knowing when they're comfortable to talk. So that was that was really interesting learning from the kids back to me. But then the, the second thing was the child psychiatrist and psychologist saying to me, and I'll get back to it, and you'll hear it a lot, you've already heard a lot, um, show some vulnerability around the dinner table and start with you. And I'm going, whoa. They said, well, you don't have to cry the first night, you muppet, you know. Um, <laughs> and so I just started with, I just started with, um, I'm really anxious about the presentation I'm doing tomorrow with Mark, for example. Um, and once I started saying that, I started getting a different conversation back. Firstly, I got <laughs> some really good advice from my 13 and 15 and, and 17 year old at the time, you know, which was really cool. And then secondly, they started saying, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm anxious about, I don't know if I've done enough study for my exams. And what you've got to realize is that whatever their anxiety is, it's their anxiety. Sometimes as parents, because we've lived those moments, we try and say, oh, you'll be fine. You know, I've been there. Just work a bit harder. And, and that's a really important moment to realize our anxieties might feel our big. And when you hear theirs, they might seem small because we've lived them and got through them. Don't underestimate and do not comment or have solutions for their anxieties. Just say once again, OK, how can I help? Do you need anything from me? <laughs> Those mm. back to that sort of thing. So I think they were the they were the they were the three lessons from the kids that I learned. Um, and then the the last thing was the you know the vulnerability around the dinner table. Yeah, great insights. Love, great. Oh, sorry, you go. I just Fiona. wanted to just jump in because I know a lot of people are worried about social media, and because we know that our kids have a different world. Well, JK and I are older than everybody, like when Methuselah and who's someone old, I don't know, but we're, we're old. But our kids grew up really hyper-connected. And 
we know that they're exposed to sexual images that we were not exposed to really young. We know that they might be exposed to real traumatic images that we were never exposed to. I remember we sat around the dinner table in the 1970s and said, oh, I am in the Hawke's Bay and Tamatia. And I can remember watching tanks on the, uh, I was in Lebanon. At six o'clock, that was where we sat down, all of us watched the news, and that was the extent of it. And even that didn't really pierce my subconscious. We now know kids are constantly on social media and exposed to images. They feel really responsible, and they're very aware that not just is there a weather event here, but it could be in Australia, the United States. They'll be knowing about Ukraine. They'll be knowing about um, what's going on in China. They'll, um, they'll be knowing about things that... We used to just get exposed to at six o'clock when dad put the TV on and it was really boring and all you could wait for was the, the programs afterwards. Yeah. And so one of the things that I suggest is, and also body image, so they've got this body image pressure, young women and young men. So one of the things that we can do as parents, I think, is you can't tell a kid really, like you don't want to be going, right, off your phones, we hate phones, all they're going to do is it's white noise and annoyance. But if you do stuff outside and go for a walk, you put your phone away because we are all on our phones. Put your phone away and try and do something like kicking a ball around in the backyard gives them space from social media. Try to have things that you're doing in the day that's not about them missing out and saying no phones, but you put your phone away and then try and give people some time and space to do something fun. And I mean, boring things like we now play board games that our kids really love. And even I was quite bored by them, but I knew that it was an important time together. So if you can create that rather than be, uh, you're too long on your phone, get off the phone, get off the computer. Don't have that narrative if you can avoid it. Because remember when we were young, who did what our parents asked? But if you can settle mm -hmm. and do something that requires them not to be on the computer or the phone and give them a break from that, and if they're playing video games, that's okay. We now know from neuroscience, video games can be a good distraction from life and actually can be a source of connection. And I'm saying that because as a parent, I used to be very stressed by the idea that my kids were on video games. I kind of limited them, and now they're both coders. I cannot believe mm -hmm. it. It all backfired. Oh, wow. But now I know actually it's a way of relaxation for kids. So not don't worry too much about that. Yeah, oh, great insights, Fiona and JK. And I, we could talk a lot about about youth, but uh, there's some fantastic questions coming through. Uh, so I might just move to those if we can. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you cope when you get one thing thrown at you after the other, when you feel you don't even have time to breathe in between? And what are your coping strategies for this? I don't know who wants to kick this one off. Uh, yeah, so so uh, me personally, I um, try and prioritise and write it down. And one of the one of the negatives for me and my um, personality is I need to go to the university of no. So I struggle to say no. Um, and what I normally do is say yes in my head and say yes straight away, which then adds to my list of things that I've got to do. Um, so. I think it's actually prioritising and having the confidence to say, look, I've got five things on the go at the moment. Um, I'm happy to do it, but it's number six and I might not get to it. Those conversations are really hard, those people, especially especially when you are working for someone and it might come from the boss or someone higher up. So I know those conversations are difficult. Um, but if you start to have them, if your boss is how he should be, he'll get it or the person that you're talking to will get it and you work out together when you're going to get to it. So that's, you know, that's, that's where what I've tried to do. Cause if I get spread too thin, I do a whole lot of things shittily. Is that a word? Shittily. Your boss might be a she too, JK. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, shittily, no. it's, a, it's a word now. Yeah. It is uh, now. Uh, did you have any comments on that question, Fiona? Yeah, of course I do. Do I ever not? No. But, um, <laughs> But in your day, challenging times, and one is find moments of calm. Even if everything's coming at you, take two or three minutes a day just to either breathe from the belly, which reminds the amygdala that everything's fine, and acknowledge your feelings. We've talked about why. Remind yourself of things that are certain, because what happens is when you're living in uncertainty, the brain thinks everything's uncertain, and uncertainty actually means that we are going to be in fight or flight. So I sometimes look around and go, there's my computer. There's my car, there's my dog. Just remind yourself of things that you know totally certain. 
it feels a bit naff, do it really quickly, and the brain goes, oh, yeah, there are some certain things in the world. And find moments where you can just be in the now. So it is like JK is a big coffee drinker, just noticing your coffee. These things don't take very long, but it just gives you those moments of calm. And the other thing is to focus on what you can control. Because when life is coming at us, our brains automatically go to this worst possible imagined future of going, oh, the next thing, there'll be another storm and then another. What you need to do is focus on what you can control. And if what you're worried about right now, and this is very true of weather events, is often we're worried about the next one. And what can be calming, we know from hurricane emergency response research, is that have an action plan about what you could do. Maybe even plan for it. Say, I've got my, and I even have this now, I've got my contact lenses in my car, because that's the only thing I would really, how would I see? And I have um, some clothes in the boot. That's my pack. And I go, okay, if something happened right now and I had to run out of my house, I'd just go to my car and I'd have my contact lenses. The moment that you have an action plan for something that you're worried about, it's no longer a worry. So if you're worrying about the next thing, about a storm, it might be clearing your gutters. Try and move, and with children, it's the same thing. Try and move to a plan of action. Stay connected to the people that matter to you because that's an actual strategy for feeling good and topping up. And that's important in moments of, of times of challenge. So maybe it's writing an email to the kids. Our kids, um, JK's got kids in Italy. I've got kids in the States. Writing emails. Well, we don't write emails, but, you know, we have a family chat. Doing that every day is helpful. And that top up and recharge is extremely important. Sleep, eat, drink, stay hydrated because we can cope better when we're looking after our body, which was in JK's five Bs. And try and keep perspective. Um, you said, Mark, that one of the big things post-emergency earthquake was that feeling of community. And sometimes I don't like, I, I think I said, don't, it's not toxic positivity, but there are some things that we learn and grow. And so if we can reframe it a little bit, there are some silver linings through COVID and through this, but also acknowledging our feelings. So you're doing both. And if you can keep those strategies front of mind, then that can be just helpful as we navigate through because it does feel like lots is coming at us. Yeah, no, great stuff. I, and I, I'm talking a lot about, you know, sharing insights with people close to you. Uh, one of the top questions here is around what say you don't have anyone close to talk to. If you're if you're alone, how do you how do you cope with stress and well and deal deal with depression if you don't have someone? We see a lot of this with elderly people through COVID. There's a lot of research. I'm doing some work with some elderly people at the moment who are living alone. And one of the things that you can do um, is, this is the thing about technology, is uh, I'm going to use an example of a, an older, older gentleman who was really struggling after he was put into lockdown on his own. And he'd been a very active member of the community. And one thing that helped him was connection to, um, he volunteered essentially. And what he did was he had a neighborhood list of neighbors and uh, of, of neighbors and he checked in on them. He just rang them every day and his well being skyrocketed. So, one thing you can do if you're living alone and don't feel connected is go to the volunteering site, New Zealand Volunteers, that you can volunteer uh, from your home, even if you've got a disability and maybe you can't get out right now. And we're finding with elderly people on their own at home, this has been really incredible, is actually you can volunteer because volunteering and giving back actually creates a sense of community. The other thing we're seeing from neuroscience is micro connections make a huge difference. So when you go to a cafe, your cafe can be your community. So if you go to a cafe and you smile at your barista, we know that you're getting oxytocin, which is the neurotransmitter of connection. When you're outside and you smile at a neighbor or someone else who's walking the dog, the brain responds as though you've got someone in your corner. So there are little things that we now know actually make a big difference. And if you are feeling really isolated and um, a little low because of isolation, turn on the television or and, and revisit a TV program with characters you like. That's why our kids watch Friends again and again and again. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. I might move to you now, JK. Firstly, a bit of feedback um, to someone here. So the most popular point here, just want to agree, it's so empowering and refreshing to hear JK speak. It's showing emotional agility and normalising the tough discussions. So well done again for you on that. Um, but the next question is around how should one work with expressing emotions and feelings when the brain's learned to suppress these emotions and feelings? Do you maybe want to comment on that? Yeah, well, that was me. 
So I had my <laughs> mental health for five years. Um, and, you know, a lot of you will know my story and it nearly got me to jump out of a window one night. So um, it's really, really scary. Really, really scary. It's the scariest thing I've ever done. The only advice I can give is take small steps with those around you who you know you can trust. And when I take small steps, it's a bit like that vulnerability that they told me with my kids. You don't have to cry the first night, right? Um, so take small steps. And when I talk about psychological safety bridges, when you're building a trust bridge with someone, um, take a four, first small step and that person will step towards you. And as they step towards you, um, then you can take another step and see if they take another step. I think... Um, when you, when you hold it up, it becomes like a volcano and then you you want to get it all out. So um, take a cautious approach. Realize that you're going to be scared shitless um, because you're worried about consequences because I was, but those consequences just didn't come. Um, once I had the courage to talk and step onto that safety bridge, uh, like a couple of people would, Dex, like, and they'll never be my friends again, um, but 95% of people helped me with my emotions and tried to help the best way they could. So I guess in summary, I know it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to sit with that uncomfortableness. Start with something little um, and, and and share that and see if someone's going to take a step towards you from a trust point of view because it's about trust and it's about care. And realise that the first person you try might be the, the wrong person. Or they might not be able to cope. One of my best mates, and he's still my best mates today, when I told him, told me to harden up. And I didn't talk to anyone for a year. Um, and the word harden up, if you're a male from my era, you'll you'll understand what that means. Uh, it can mean 150 million things. Um, but we speak about it now. It wasn't his fault. He just didn't know what to do. He said, shit, I'm not the psychiatrist, JK. I'm a bloody farmer, you idiot. You know? <laughs> um <laughs> So, so sometimes when you do step on that psychological safety bridge, you might not get the right answer straight away. But I just, it took me a year because I went back into my shell. But if I had a, retrospectively, I would have tried again the next day, right? Because you will find someone that will care, that will step towards you, you know? Um, so that was a long answer. But if I summarize, mm. it will be uncomfortable. You will feel scared. You will feel vulnerable. So just start with a little step. The first person you talk to might be the wrong one. Keep trying, and eventually you'll find someone um, that will be able to relate and help you through that anguish. Mm -hmm. no, good call. And I guess on, on a similar vein, the next question, uh, how, how do you deal with an employee who just continues to remain low, uh, regardless of them you know, sharing their emotions and having care shown? Uh, in this case, nothing's changing. How do you what what do you do next? Yeah, like I don't I don't know if Fiona can answer this, but I do know that it was a scary cycle for me in that hell. I was starting to get used to it and it was starting to become my life. And that was really scary. So in a weird sense, I was actually um in hell, but getting comfortable with the hell. So I had to try and break the cycle. Um so I can only tell you what I was personally like. Um but for me, it was about the tools and techniques. And one of the one of the reasons why Fiona and I are so passionate about Groove is every single person in the world needs a daily mental health plan. We call them the six pillars. Um, and so if you're down, and, and this is what I talk about with the greatest psychiatrist that I went to gave me homework, right? And I left school at 15 and never did any homework. So you can imagine how that reaction was me. But that, that homework was, JK, I'm going to give you some tools that you're going to have to use if you want to get better, right? And so you will not, you will stay down unless you actually start putting some of those tools in place. You know, and the first tool for me was breathing. Um, and I was actually looking through my, my PowerPoints um, and 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 so I first learned how to breathe, and this is this is what it did for me. Um, you know, this is what breathing does for me. It it stops me rushing. It helps me sleep, right? It helps me. It helps me um, when I'm a little bit upset, right? And it helps me maintain my calm. But when I first learned breathing, my psychiatrist said do you want to attack your anxiety attacks, JK, that you're getting on an airplane? And I said, yes, please. I thought she was going to give me another pill. She taught me how to breathe, 
right? So someone who stays down, and I'm generalizing and I'll throw to Dr. Fiona, you know, you're going to stay down unless you put some actions in place to get you out of it. And it's really hard. So it becomes a downward cycle. But the first thing I learned to do was breathe. And that was the first tool that I started to, to learn. And that's that's what it does for me now. Um, among many other tools, and some didn't work for me, right? But the homework for me was, if you want to get out of this JK, you've got to have a daily mental health plan of which it should, um, you know, and... And it'll come around tools, worry maps that Fiona spoke about, breathing, you know, connection, all those types of things. Yeah. Oh, sorry, really... before I move to sorry, Fiona, just before I move to you, I just get a message to well, we're going to wrap it up shortly. So just any, you know, can, if you can and incorporate any final words uh, sure. in your statements, if that's all right. Sure, of course. Thank um, you. It's really, it's really tough, and we are not responsible for others. What we can do is create an environment that doesn't make them worse. So we don't want to be adding to stress and adding to people's load in a way um, that's detrimental to them. And that doesn't mean workload. Everyone's got workload. And a little bit of pressure is a good thing. But if you have got someone in your team that you are worried about, one of the things that we talk about at Grove is there are things that you can do that are ingrained in your workday. Breathing is one of them. Like before a meeting, we all breathe. And you know, it might feel a little weird, but actually you've just given someone a gift. We're going to take a minute just before we start this meeting and we're just going to breathe. Or we're going to take a walking meeting. Or we're just going to spend, um, at the end of the day, everyone shouts out what they did well because New Zealanders are very bad at patting themselves on the back. And if you have that absolutely as part of the rituals of your team, then that will be helpful to everybody. And hopefully, then that will also be helpful to the person who is down. But it, apart from giving them the, the, the tools and then asking them um, whether or not they need more help and directing them to 1737 or EAP, you have to remember that this isn't yours to solve. All you can do is step beside them be there, be the hand that's out, but also look after yourself. And modelling goes a long way. And if you can bring some little things into your workday, like breathing, getting outside, everyone shouting out what they're doing well, the shout out board, not just for others, but for self, we know that helps with the well-being of everybody, including the people that may be struggling. Excellent, excellent. Any final words from you, JK, before we um, wrap uh, I've up? got a couple. So um, this is my mantra. <laughs> if it's meant to be, it's up to me. So I spoke to a teacher the other day and all the kids are worrying about the environment and stuff. And he asked my advice. And I just said, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. If your kid's worried about that, then get rid of the plastics in your own home or do something in your neighborhood that you can control because it feels massive out there. I'm worried about the environment, but shit, what do I do? I've actually got to start you know, doing stuff myself. And I know... Um, firstly, I just want to thank you for your time today, you beautiful people. Thank you for jumping online. Um, I hope you've got a couple of things you can take away, but I just want to um, say this to you. Dot and dat, right? Just do one of these things. Do one thing. What Dr. Fiona and I are passionate about is habitual change. Habitual change is really hard, right? Um, so pick one of the things we've spoken about and dot, do one thing. And then once you've done dot, do that. Do another thing. Okay? So don't go out there and go, oh, I've got to do a million things. Do one thing. Choose one thing. If it doesn't sit with you, try another thing. So do dot, then do that. Okay? And we'll all be good. A real Great way to finish. Um, uh, look, thank you, everyone. Some fantastic questions, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we will try and summarise some of the, um, you know, get to those questions and summarise them in, in the in the post uh, webinar note that we'll send out. Um, but thank you very much to everyone for attending, and a special thank you to our panelists, uh, J.K. and Fiona. I love the um, the slides, J.K. I love the backgrounds you both got. Um, just some fantastic insights, and I'm sure everyone's gained from that. Um, so, a recording of this webinar will be shared along with you, uh, links to useful resources discussed in the session, in particular Groove, and that's G R O O V without a, without an E, isn't that right? Um, the there will be a survey poll at the end uh, on the right of your screen, so please give us your feedback. We really appreciate that, so we can um, know what to do and to deliver in future. A quick plug to the next smart session, where, where it's upcoming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, what businesses can do when they're experiencing cash flow challenges through hardship. So quite a different theme, but um, a good one nonetheless. If people remember what you do to support them through tough times uh, and how you act, 
And I'll never forget how my colleagues uh, from around the country supported me, uh, my team and our customers uh, in our time of need. And I feel <clears throat> now is my time to give back. And I, I love how the Westpac um, whānau have, have come together to support our people and our customers in Hawke's Bay East Coast and North Auckland and Northland. Uh, the bank, as, as a bank, um, our financial support we give is vital. Um, and you may not be aware, but among other things, Westpac's pledged $3 million to support, support affected customers in the community. Uh, but emotional support is just as important. So I hope today has gone some way to help uh, you with that. Uh, all the very best to you all. Uh, kia kaha. Stay strong. Thank you.